Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. I, I'm pleased we've done this because I just feel it's honouring to God. And for those that want to be here, it is a great opportunity just to worship God. I can put my glasses on. I took them off because of my mask. Oh dear, this is now going to be on record. <laughs> Uh, and welcome to anyone watching at home. I've just lost my glasses, but found them, so that's good. <laughs> I'm going to light the Advent candle. Uh, Sarah, would you like to do this? <laughs> Don't have to, but... <laughs> yeah. So, you have, I'm afraid you've got five tonight, thank you. All five, All five yeah, thank you. So we do this over the uh, four weeks of Advent and Christmas Day. And the first candle is the fathers and mothers of Israel. The second is the prophets. The third is Ma John the Baptist. The fourth is Mary. And the white one in the center is Jesus, the light of the world. Thank you. Bless you. <laughs> so I'll say a prayer as we think about that, and then we'll move into our service. Lord Jesus, we thank you for Christmas Day, which was yesterday, and all the build-up is huge, and all the excitement, but on a day like today, there's just a sense of quiet and reflection, and I thank you for that. We thank you for all that Christmas means, all that it means to the world, all that it means to us personally. We thank you for Jesus, the light of the world, bringing light into our lives even when they feel dark, you are there to guide us. We give you thanks for that great gift. Amen. Amen. Um, the day after Christmas Day, we all know as Boxing Day, but it's also actually the Feast of Stephen. Uh, um, and we'll come to that in a second. We're only going to sing one song this morning. We haven't got accompaniment, so it'd be quite fun trying this. But what I'm going to do first is say our prayer of confession, and then we'll have a go at singing. We'd like to come into God's presence Yes, it's Christmas, we've all had fun, but in the midst of it all, we just want to acknowledge any things on our hearts and, and make our peace with God. He's gracious and loves to forgive, but he just asks that we're real and honest with him. So let's say this prayer of confession. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, we are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. And so may Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Can I ask, I think Angela's here to read our scripture for us. Thank you. The reading today is taken from Luke chapter 2, verses 25 to 35. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus, to do for him what the custom of the law required. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, 
this child is destined to be cause sorry is des this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the faults of many hearts would be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too this is the word of the lord Well, thank you, uh, Angela. So we've moved very quickly, I'm afraid, from the birth of Jesus now to the story of him being uh, dedicated at the temple after the period of purification for, for Mary as a mother. He's brought to the temple, and there uh, Simeon prophesies over him, and of course Anna does as well. Um, but I wanted to, and I, wrote, I chose that reading uh, with that last phrase in mind, actually. A sword will pierce your own soul too. So here is Mary in the temple. I've got our picture of Mary somewhere here, yeah, over there, if you can see. Uh, we did that on last week uh, as a collage in church. Um, she's there with Joseph, with the baby, and this wonderful moment where this, this man who's devoted himself to prayer says, this is the anointed of God, this is the Messiah. I'm privileged to see. I've lived long enough to actually see God's Messiah. And when you think of these candles, the thousands of years they represent <laughs> from Abraham and, and all the descendants, that's what Simeon was witnessing, the light of the world. But then the Spirit of God lays on his heart that Mary needs to just know that actually her calling is actually really tough, that having brought this light into the world, this life into the world, she would have to yield it up to God and, and that she, her soul would be pierced with a sword. And there is, in the Bible and, and in the Christmas story, there is that shadow of the cross, isn't there? The shadow of the cross. In that, that is hinted at in that very sentence. And, of course, we see the suffering of the world in things like the slaughter of the innocents. There is this other side. There's the, there's the tinsel and the light and the joy, but there's this other side, isn't there, of human sin and God's uh, rescue mission for mankind, a very serious rescue mission. And it's in the background, and in a sense, that's why I want to make the connection with St. Stephen, all right? or better known really just as Stephen uh, from the New Testament. And his story is told in Acts chapter 6 and 7. And that in itself is remarkable, that he's got whole two chapters. Because, <laughs> you know, he, he wasn't one of the apostles, he wasn't one of the big names. Uh, but he was a great, significant person. And just to remind you of the story, in Acts chapter 6, uh, the apostles are realising that actually they need help. Uh, they're trying to distribute food, they're trying to serve the community and the, and the church, and they need help just at the practical level, distributing the food fairly and things like this. And so they say, we need seven people that will be our, they call them deacons, but they will be our helpers to organise things, run things. And they don't just choose practical people, the selection criteria is that they have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So they're, they're choosing good people to do this work, Acts chapter 6. I'll just find the page because I can refer to it a little bit. Whoops. So that once they've chosen, that's, that's, and they get on with it. But then you, they lay hands on them. They, they list the five. Uh, this, right, this, catch my breath. They list who they are. They list, they choose Stephen, Philip, Procurus, Nicana, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas. Um, they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So they're commissioned, they're anointed. And it says in verse 8, Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. So he's a huge anointing from God. He's a practical man, but really a of God. And then it says, Opposition arose, however, from the members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria. They began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and they brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs of Moses handed down to us. All who were listed sitting in the Sanhedrin, looked intensely at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. That's the end of chapter 6. Then in chapter 7, Stephen addresses the Sanhedrin. There are lots of echoes of the life of Christ 
you know, the false witnesses, they're being dragged up before the Sanhedrin. There's a lot of Jesus echoed and, and reflected in Stephen. And Stephen gives this long talk, really, in a sense, doing what we did in very brief form. He goes to the story of Israel. He goes right back to Abraham, and he talks about Moses. And he says, look, God has been preparing the way. And at that point, they're all really enjoying what he's saying, because it's all about Israel, and their patriotism kicks in. And, and they're, they're, he's possibly even starting to win them over. And there's a long speech, all recorded in Acts chapter 7. But it goes on, and he goes through Moses, he talks about David. But he says, however, and he talks about the temple, he says, however, the Most High does not live in houses made by men. And he, he quotes from Isaiah. Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? So he then just pulls in to think, well, is the temple really what it's all about? And then he launches in with this. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was put into effect through the angels, but have not obeyed it. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus, standing at the right hand of God, look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul was there, giving approval to his death. On that day, a great persecution arose against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But, Stephen, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Sounds terrible, doesn't it? And yet in God's providence, that scattering was like blowing a dandelion. <laughs> you know, the seeds were scattered and the word of God spread, and the church grew. And this is the paradox of the Christian life, isn't it? That often blessing and trouble go hand in hand, <laughs> you know? And that's what happened with Stephen. His death was a catalyst for the growth of the church. And he himself died praying forgiveness for those who were persecuting, just as Jesus did. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So we have these beautiful echoes of Jesus in Stephen's life. But it does remind us, doesn't it, this, this complex world that we live in. You know, we pray for blessing. And often blessing comes, but rarely is blessing undiluted. <laughs> you know, rarely do you have a day when it's, it's all blessing, you know. There's blessing and there's trouble. And we all know that. Um, and that's why I wanted to sort of, actually today was a nice day to, to just note those themes. Because it's there in Mary's life. It's there in St. Stephen's life. What I want to do to, to, to pull the threads together is go back to our little song, which I found surprisingly helpful. I know the language is very old-fashioned, but obviously it tells the story of this, this king who uh, is in Bohemia, which is Czechoslovakia, or it's not called that now, is it? Slovakia and the other one, Czech Republic. Um, so he's from that part of the world. He was a king, he was godly and, and esteemed by his people and eventually became uh, recognised as Saint King Wenceslas. And I've never been to Czechoslovakia, but I'm told that Wenceslas Square is, is a particularly lovely place to visit in, in uh, Prague, in the capital. So that's something to do one day if you ever get the chance. But I like the story um, and I like the song, but just to extend the metaphor a little bit, Here's the page, you know, trudging through the snow. Probably didn't want to do it, <laughs> like a lot of things in life. <laughs> like, yeah, I won't go into it. Um, Sire, he says, the night is darker now, and the wind blows stronger. Fails my heart. I know not how I can go no longer. 
Now, have you felt that in your life, your Christian life sometimes? You know, that I thought, actually, when I read it again, I thought, wow, that actually... And I, I reckon the person writing this got that, actually. I don't think that's just coincidence. I think he's writing from his own heart. You know, we, we foul and falter. It's just jolly hard. And then, this is what the king says in the story. Mark my footsteps, good, my page. Tread thou in them boldly. Thou shalt find the winter's rage freeze thy blood less coldly. Now imagine Jesus saying that, okay? Because I think that's more helpful. Right? The king's nice, but imagine Jesus saying that. Mark my footsteps, my friend, my child. Tread in those footsteps boldly. You shall find the winter's rage freeze thy blood less coldly. And I really feel the call of God in that. Now we want to be followers of Christ, so let's look at his footsteps through the, the dark times when all we see is shadow and keep close to each footstep. You can only see in the snow a, a yard ahead of you, can't you? You know, just the next pace. And that's all he wants of us, is the next step, the next step. And may this be said of us, of the Lord Jesus, in his masters, not King Wenceslas, that's for Jesus, in his master's step he trod, where the snow lay dinted. Heat was in the very sod which the saint had printed. Therefore, Christian men, be sure, wealth or rank possessing, ye who now will bless the poor, shall yourselves find blessing. So it's a call to follow Jesus, to, to be generous to the poor, but let's put our footsteps, even in the snow, in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Stephen did. We see how his, his death echoes the death of Jesus. That's what Mary did in her own way, just faithful. We know there were times when she doubted. We know there were times in the gospel recorded where she tried to call Jesus back, but he pressed on. So she wasn't you know, uh, without her own struggles, but she was faithful. And even in the early church, she was there. You see all the accounts. Mary's in the background. Uh, may we be there following Jesus one step at a time. Amen. So we're going to stand and say our creed and then Jill is going to lead us in prayer. So the words will be on the screen and we'll just stand and just remind ourselves that this baby born in the stable there's so much more to say about him, and this reflects some of that in our creed. So we say together, I believe in Jesus Christ, and in the beauty of the gospel begun in Bethlehem. I believe in the one whose spirits glorified a little town, and whose spirit stills bring music to the persons all over the world, in towns both large and small. I believe in the one for whom the crowded inn could find no room, and I confess that my heart still sometimes wants to exclude Christ from my life today. I believe in the one who rulers of the earth ignored and the proud could never understand, whose life was among the common people, whose welcome came from persons of hungry hearts. I believe in the one who proclaimed the love of God to be invincible. I believe in the one whose cradle was a mother's arms, whose modest home in Nazareth had love for its only wealth who looked at persons and made them see what God's love saw in them, who by love brought sinners back to purity and lifted human weakness up to meet the strength of God. I confess my everlasting need of God, the need of forgiveness for our selfishness and greed, the need of new life for empty souls, the need of love for hearts grown cold. I believe in God who gives us the best of himself, I believe in Jesus, the Son of the living God, born in Bethlehem for me and for the world. Amen. So please be seated and uh, Jill will lead us. Thank you. Don't we have a lot to give thanks for today? We survived this challenging year, and here we are the day after the big day. For some of us that's sad, but for others it's a relief. Let's thank God. Oh, 
that most of us, if not all of us here, had a roof over our head and food to eat, and I dare say we received a present or two. That's not the case for everyone in the world, nor even for everyone in this country. Before I begin, I want to quote from an email I received from Tear Fund, a Christian aid agency, recently, which I think is worth quoting. 2,000 years ago, in a small corner of Western Asia, then called Judea, God's people would have been heartbroken. They had known centuries of unanswered prayer, generations of disappointment, growing to despair as they awaited a Messiah who wouldn't seem to come. For a girl called Mary, what hope did prayer carry? The history of her people was one of oppression, enslaved by the Egyptians, swept away by the, torn apart by warring tribes, swept away by the Assyrians, taken into exile by the Babylonians, invaded by the Greeks, conquered by the Romans. To be a person of prayer in such circumstances was an audacious act. From what we learn of her in the Gospels, Mary was such a person. This Christmas, after such a painful time so many of us have endured, let us continue to look for the longed for and to dream of the unexpected because we can look back all those years ago to the most unexpected blessing of all. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for all your many blessings to us both individually and as a nation. We pray for those who live in poverty in this country for whatever reason, and we pray that employers will be able to pay fair wages for fair work. We pray for all our young people who have suffered in so many ways during their formative years and have missed out on friendship through no fault of their own and have found it so difficult to take exams because of having to isolate so much and school closures. We ask that they will be helped to achieve their best despite all of that in the world they're growing up in. We thank you that we have the opportunity to be vaccinated in this country against the coronavirus, but we pray that this opportunity will be available to everyone in the world, especially in those countries which are poorer, and that the rich countries will not hoard such a valuable resource for themselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Christchurch as we move into a new year this week, that we'll be guided as to how we open up the church our services and outreach to the, our community. Give wisdom, we pray, to the parochial church council as I consider this in the weeks and months to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for the people of Afghanistan as they are in the grip of a very cold winter in sub-zero temperatures and half the population does not have enough to, food to eat because they have no money to buy it with no jobs and no real infrastructure. We pray for the children, especially the girls, who are not allowed to go to school. We pray for wisdom for the international community in tackling the situation and that you, Father, will resolve the problems leading to the rising costs of everyday items to stop even more people being pushed further into poverty. We pray for the Christian aid agencies working to help them and we pray that you'll protect them. We pray to you for an end to the coronavirus pandemic, which is exacerbating all these problems. We pray to, for our Christian brothers and sisters who live in countries where they face persecution and harassment every day, especially at Christmas time. We pray they will know your presence very real to them now. We pray for all who face persecution and harassment because of their faith or race or gender, and especially those in Palestine, the Roma people in Romania, and the black people in the United States and elsewhere. We pray for those who have fled persecution and have sought refuge in their own country or in other countries, including in Britain. May they find friendship and fellowship with your church in the country where they are now. You, Lord, were a refugee when you were a child on earth, escaping from Herod, and you have told us to love those who are foreigners. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now, Father, we pray for those who are unwell, whom we know, whether in mind, in body, or in spirit. We pray for the elderly and isolated, and those who are struggling with their mental health. May they find empathy and hope. For those we know who have cancer, and those who are suffering with coronavirus, we pray for healing and hope. And may this world be rid of coronavirus quickly, we pray. 
accept these prayers for the sake of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Just, um, thank you. Uh, in a second, we're going to have communion. I'll explain about that and just one or two other bits of information as well. So the way we're doing communion here for any visitors, there's a couple, I see, <laughs> uh, is uh, I'm having the bread and wine after you lot. And that, the idea of that is so that uh, we can have just a little bit of bread, a wafer bread, um, and dip it in the wine, and you have bread and wine at the same time in that way. So you're not having to drink the cup or anything like that. Um, it's the recommended system and it's working quite well actually. So it's not ideal, I don't, you know, it's, it's nice to have a proper sip of wine, but at least we are having both those symbols and can reflect upon that as we, as we receive it. So basically if you come forward, you might want to sanitise your hands, I'll have sanitised my hands and we'll come here and just come forward, socially distance and make your way back to your seat. It might be best to eat the bread once you get back because that way you're not having to open your mask and all this sort of thing. So that's, that's the safe way of doing that. Uh, just to also to say that um, this Friday with our watch night service, if you want to come to that, bring in the new year in church with praise to God. That's 11 o'clock, ending about 10 past 12, I guess, just after 12. Uh, the following Sunday, I'm not around. I've got Sharon leading the service for me. I'm just taking a little break. I'll be back on the 9th. If you need to contact the church or, or want help, just phone the church number. There'll be cheap people checking the messages and they'll get the right help. Uh, they can be in touch with me, but probably the other people helping most likely. Uh, but I'm still around if, if uh, that need is needed. Um, and then on the 9th, it'll be back. Uh, junior Church will be meeting again. And for those of you that did the Hearing God's Word course, uh, we'll carry on part two of that on the 9th at 4 o'clock. Um, so put that in your diary. <laughs> and then for anyone who's interested in the following Christ course, that will start, I think it's the 13th of Feb, 4 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon as well. And that's for confirmation or just people interested in finding out about Jesus. So there's cards at the back with all our Christmas uh, services on, but on the back is a reminder about the following Christ course. So if you're interested in that, pick up a card and you can write it in your diary and just keep that free. So just a little bit of information there. Um, and... Uh, I hope you all do have a lovely new year and I look forward to seeing you when I get back. So let's move on into our communion. We commun begin our communion with the sharing of the peace and we'll just stand and offer one another peace and just wave as a sign of God's peace. So let's stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. Let's offer each other a sign of peace. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. <laughs> So we'll just stand, remain standing for the blessing of the, the bread and wine, and then we'll sit for the rest of communion. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed, at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. 
as we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory. Send your Holy Spirit, that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. So please sit and we'll turn to the Lord's Prayer. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Draw near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Let's say our prayer of thanksgiving for our communion. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. So that brings our service uh, to a close. I'll say a prayer of blessing. Um, but may you all have a really peaceful and blessed uh, Christmas season, New Year, uh, and I do hope you get time for rest and, and prayer and reflection as well as fun and partying. Um, so let's go with God's peace and blessing. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. God bless you. And thank you everyone for coming for the, and team for helping. Bless you. Thank you.